about to, uh, to get started. Had a bit of a delay, but I do apologize for that. We're going to get started in, well, just right now. So thank you all for being on the line. No problem. Okay. Welcome. All right. Well, uh, I'm, I'm a, I, I guess I, I, made, I made a phone call kind of right before I got started today. And, um, you know, just again dealing with the, the, uh, the tough realities, I keep saying it, of living, of living in this fallen world. And um, God has his way of, of showing us that, uh, again, all power is still his. He still does what he does in the, uh, in the life of people. And so I want us to be praying for uh, Sister Chandler's daughter. Many of us know Sharon uh, has a daughter named Kristen Henry who uh, has been very... <laughs> Hello? Hello. I'm sorry. Y'all excuse me just a moment, please. Are y'all back? Yeah, I am. Okay, then. All right, thank you. Um, my daughter's been very ill, and uh, a couple of years ago, 2018, 36-year-old son uh, died, and now uh, her daughter just turned 36. She's dying. She's dying. And so, well, it's always a tough thing. Uh, so, Father, we, uh, we lift our hands to you. We lift our hearts to you. We are always uh, dependent on you, relying on you. <coughs> always with a sense of a uh, how much we need you. And so I pray for this family. I pray for Sister Chandler. I pray for her daughter. I pray for Christine Henry, uh, whom the doctors have, uh, have said that's everything that they can do. And uh, her body is no longer functioning as it should. But God, I know you got power. I know... Oof, you are able to do what we cannot do. And in the midst of all that's taken place, we recognize some things have nothing to do with the coronavirus, has nothing to do with COVID-19. We're still living in a fallen world. We are still living in a world where disease and division and death is still taking place. And so, Father, in the words of our elders, we stretch our hands to you. No other help we know. If you would draw yourself from us, where shall we go? So, Father, we thank you for comfort. We thank you for power. We thank you for presence. God, our heart goes out to this mom, this mother, Lord, who can't even go see her child because of the issues of the COVID-19. But, God, I know you, you know what you're doing, Lord. We, 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 we know that so many things about what we, you do that we don't fully understand. But God, we, we know you are a wise God and that whatever you do, it's always the best means possible. So Lord, our heart goes out to her. Our tears go with her. Our concern goes with her. Our pain goes with her. Her sorrow goes with her. And we just ask again for healing as only you're able to do. We pray for Viesta, and you know the issues that she is currently dealing with, what she is facing, God. I pray for healing in her body and her spirit and in her mind, Lord, that you would touch her in the name of Jesus. We pray for Hope's family and uh, affectionately known as Aunt Margaret, for uh, uh, Miss Jean and all of the rest of the family, Pastor Eldridge, and the issues that they're dealing with, God, I just lift that family before you and ask again your grace and your mercy uh, continue to be upon each and every one of us. Uh, God, again, for all of our members from Sister Phil uh, to the baby and tease belly, God, we, we ask again you continue to keep us in your perfect peace. Keep us 
would our minds always stay on you, Lord. Keep us reliant upon you. Keep us dependent upon you. Keep us to know, help us to know again that all of our help, all of our hope, it comes from you. And so we thank you, God, for being good, for being gracious, for being kind, for being loving, for being caring. And we again ask that you would give us strength so that we can strengthen others in that time of sorrow, in that time of need, in that time of pain, in that time of difficulty. Help us again to be the church that you've called for us to be, to know that wherever we are, you are good. Wherever we are, you are gracious. Whatever we're going through, you are fair. You are gracious. Uh, you're never unfair. You're never unjust. You're always righteous. And we thank you for that reality. We pray now that you would be with us in these minutes uh, that we have to share your word, that God, that you would open our hearts and our minds and help us to see you for who you really are. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. 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 I, I want to ask us, um, um, Good Shepherd, if you would turn to 2 Second, Second Kings. We, we're studying that book right now as part of our reading. And my hope is that you all, um, uh, as members of this congregation, are taking heed to the reading that we've uh, asked. You know, we're reading one chapter, one chapter a day. But the whole issue of reading the chapter is not just to read it, it's to see what God is doing, to see what, what is God revealing about himself, what is he revealing to us about ourselves as we, uh, as we study his word. So today what we want to do is just take a little time uh, to look at um, the, um, the ministry of uh, the man of God by the name of Elisha. Um, some of you have the handouts that, that has already been sent by email and the like, and uh, we're all going to do this again tonight at 7 o'clock for those of you uh, who have family members that uh, may not be doing it this morning. Just inform them I'll be on the conference call tonight at 7, and we'll go uh, back over it again. Uh, but just reading the handout, again, for those of you who may not be privy to it, the history of Second Kings spanned the time of over 400 years. After Solomon's death, the nation was divided as Israel and Judah. There were 10 tribes in the north who existed in the promised land for 209 years until they were overtaken by Assyria. Then the two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin, existed 345 years until they were exiled by Babylon. During those years, all the kings of Israel were evil. In Judah, some were good, but most were evil. However, God had his prophets who reminded the kings and the people that thus said the Lord. The most prominent of his prophets during that era was Elisha. He was the consistent voice and representative who showed that God still ruled in his kingdom according to his purpose. And so what we're going to do is look at a brief survey of the ministry of Elisha. Excerpts of what we're going to be looking at today uh, comes from the whole Old Testament historical book, uh, it's a book that's been written by Israel Loken of uh, DTS and the College of Biblical Studies. And so what we want to do is to see that right now we are, we are, as the children of God, we are part of the kingdom of God. We're part of the kingdom of God. And as a result of being part of the kingdom of God, we also live in the nation of the United States of America. Uh, and regardless to whatever is happening in the nation, God wants us to understand that the things that he has determined for us as people of his kingdom are different than that of the nation. That is just, that's important. He wants us to understand that regardless of what goes on in the nation, if you would, of the people, that the priorities, the rules, the commandments, the statutes, the ordinances, those things that he has given to us as children of the kingdom of God, or we would use the kingdom of heaven, still apply to us. So when we read through the book of 2 Kings, or we read through 1 Kings and 2 Kings now that we're reading, we see that it has established a kingdom. These kingdoms were ruled primarily by Saul, first king of Israel, then by David, the second king of Israel, and then by Solomon. Uh, in the life of David and Solomon, David, because he was a warrior, had an opportunity to have peace all around him. Solomon, when he became king, had no enemies. 
Uh, and as a result now, uh, God made Israel probably the most, not at that time, was the most prominent kingdom or the prominent, most prominent nation in the world. And these, these, these nations were ruled by human kings. But also understand that in the midst of that, that even though from the standpoint of Saul, who kind of was a wishy-washy king, David was a king who really loved God, Solomon, who actually started right, but he ended, he ended not so well. Uh, the problem was because the Bible says he loved women, and as a result of the women that he loved, he, his, his heart was divided. He, he, he no longer loved just God. He loved God plus, in his mind, the 700 wives, the 300 concubines. He loved God, plus he had learned to now worship those pagan gods of uh, those uh, women that he had been given, those wives that he had been given for political reasons. And so his heart was divided. And so that, as a result, God had said to him that because of your divided heart, I'm now going to divide your kingdom. But he, God made the promise he wasn't going to do it in Solomon's time, but he was going to do it with Solomon's son. Uh, Rehoboam was the first son, but God had already raised up, uh, risen a, uh, a adversary by the name of Re Jeroboam, who was not a king, who was not, he was really a, a great military general. He raises him up, uh, and eventually he becomes the, the leader, if you would, of the ten tribes to the north. But in the midst of all of the evil, that was going on in the nation at that time, God always had his representative, namely the prophets. And that's the good thing about it. And so when you think about those prophets who represented God, it would help us to understand that here we are as the church of Jesus Christ, still part of the kingdom of God, what, representing God in the midst of a nation where, where we see a lot of evil. We, 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 we have to admit it. We see a lot of evil in our nation. I mean, you know, abortion is, is part of our reality. Um, sex trafficking is a part of our reality. There's a lot of crime in our nation. There's a lot of separation in our nation. There's a lot of division uh, in our nation. And so our nation is not a healthy nation. It is not, it was, it is not a Christian nation, per se. But within the nation, we who are the people of God ought to be living, what, like the children of God. Why? Because what we recognize, what he is our king. And so though we have presidents and governors and commissioners and mayors and city council people, we have all of those kinds of rep human representatives. At the end of the day, all of them are preceded or superseded by God. God, who is our king. So what we want to do is sort of look at the life of Elisha, Elisha in this case. One of the best ways to, to kind of keep them in mind when you think of who came first, Elijah or Elisha, just think of the alphabet. J comes before S, Elijah, then you get Elisha. So we're going to look at Elisha and his life. Uh, looking at the handout again, number one, the Lord used Elisha to provide water you fill it in the blanks here, without wind or rain for the kings of Israel, Judah, and Edom. We've got to kind of, kind of walk through. Uh, we've got to go through some things sort of, sort of quickly. That was a time that there was, go to 2 Kings chapter 3, if you will. That was a time when there was a, a drought in the land. Three kings come to Elisha, and they're asking him, what can he do about this drought? What can he do to solve this drought? Uh, what, what was amazing, we look at verse 17 of 2 Kings chapter 3, it says, for thus says the Lord, and that's the key thing, for thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter, in the sight of the Lord, he will also deliver the Moabites into your hands, also you shall attack every fortified uh, city, every choice city, and shall cut down every good tree and stop up every spring of water and, and ruin every good piece of land with the stones. Now, it happened just as God said. In other words, here they were. They, they were in a drought. It had not rained, and so there was no water. 
And so people who are in battle, if you will, I mean, it, it's the most necessary resource that we have is water. But isn't it amazing, because of Elijah and because, Elisha, I'm sorry, and his love for God, his obedience to God, the Bible says, he says, thus said the Lord, and now here you are, here it is, you got ditches, you got streams, you got all of these things that are vessels for water that are now being filled up and there's no wind or rain. Oh my God, that's got to be God, right? So when you think about it in your own life, here's the question that I want us to answer all the way through as we think about the life of Elijah. Is he the same God? Is he the same Lord? Does he have the same power? And when you look at this, I want you to just think about things in your life that, in a sense, you think that some things have dried up. You think of some things that, that, that were one way and they are no longer the way that they were. Um, uh, right now, we have, been, we have been into this pandemic. Uh, we have been doing the, the, the streaming live, the virtual thing, and all this kind of thing. It's 100 days. Uh, we actually started March 22nd, which was the fourth, su fourth Sunday in March, and here it is on this particular Wednesday today. It's about 100 days that we're into this thing, and some of us feel like, man, some stuff just done dried up. You know, the uh, main thing is we can't come to church like we want to, so we kind of feel like some things done dried up on us, but isn't it amazing that God is still filling in things even though... It's not how it used to be. Even though we can't come to the building, we're still filled with joy and happiness. We're still filled with hope and expectation. Why is that? Because we believe that God will supply what we need, but he does it the way he chooses to do it. He doesn't do it the way he you would think water ought to come by rain, right? But he does it a total different way. And one of the things that God wants us to do is to see how is he filling in those empty spots in your life? How is he filling what you would call those dry areas of your life? How is he doing that? Just pay attention to it. And if you can say today that, you know what, what I think about at least, Skinner, you know what, I, I do recognize that God is filling in some dry spots for me that I never ever thought about it that way. And right now you ought to just give him thanks. Right now you ought to praise him because the same God that worked through Elijah is the same God who's working on our behalf today. Number two, the Lord used him to save the lives of a widow and her sons from a jar of oil that filled many vessels. Go to chapter 4. Go to chapter 4. And it says, And a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know your servant feared the Lord, and the credit is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elijah said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons when you pour in into those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him, shut the door behind her and a son who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now, it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel, so the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Isn't that amazing how God does it? Here's a lady. She's about to die. Her and her two sons, they get ready to have their last meal, if you will. Elijah so shows up. The representative of God shows up, and he says to her, go borrow as many vessels as you can, not just a few, as many as you can get. Just go get them all. She goes, she sends her son, her and herself, and they go out, and they get all of these vessels. And watch this, from that one jar, just one jar, she begins to pour, and she kept pouring, and she kept pouring, and she kept pouring, and she kept pouring. Pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. Oh, I'm so excited about this. She just kept pouring. And the Bible says it got to the point they had no more jars to fill. And now she could sell that oil and her and her sons can live. How many times has God stretched your money? 
How many times has God stretched your resources when it looked like, hey, man, we about to run out here. We don't have enough. We don't know how we're going to do this thing. But God has a way of showing because you are part of his kingdom. He has a way of making that thing stretch. Can I get somebody to help me today? Man, you know, I told y'all when I coming up, I thought we were some rich people. I did. I thought we were rich. I just, I knew it. In my mind, my daddy had some kind of money tree somewhere that all I had to do was ask and daddy would go to that tree and he would get that money. I mean, that's just the way I, but I'm telling you now when I look back on it, I saw how my mama knew how to make things stretch. I'm telling you, because the resources were not always there as I thought they were. But as a child who was living in a house of people who were believers, I didn't have to worry about it. Why? Because my mom and my daddy had it under control. Here's what I'm trying to tell you about God, that there are times in life when the resources run low. There are sometimes the resources may even run out. But listen, this is what God said to us. I, I, uh, he was said, uh, 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 David would say this, I was young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed, watch this, begging bread. It doesn't mean they didn't ask for some bread. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that, watch this, I remember, now I can recall that sometimes coming up as a, as a kid, living on 6018 Los Angeles Street, and man, there were some times that we had to go get some sugar. We had to go get some butter. We had to go get some flour. 6202 Los Angeles, Wallace and Mary J. Johnson. And I didn't know that we didn't have it in the house, but God was showing that there was another way that he was able to supply what we needed. We moved to 7402 Cattle. Well, guess what? God placed somebody in, at next door to us, 7406 Cattle. They named Alvis and Elvina LaFleur. And there were times I would see Mom and, and Aunt Elvina, they're making exchanges on things. Why? Because what God was showing that when it looks like things are running out, he knows how, y'all, to supply, and he makes that thing stretch. Have you ever had a dollar to stretch? You ever had $10 to stretch? You ever had your health to stretch? God knows how to make it keep on pouring, y'all. He really does. So watch this, number three. It says, the Lord gave a barren woman, if you're filling in the blanks. Remember the last one, the, the, the number two was vessels. Uh, number three, a barren woman, a son, who eventually died but was restored to life by his use of Elisha. Wow, wow. Here was a woman, and, and, and you, pick, you see that in, in particular in chapter 4, verse 8, uh, through, through uh, really, really to the end, literally to the end of the chapter almost. And so, uh, so here it is. You got a, you got a woman uh, who's, who's barren. Um, uh, Elisha shows up. Uh, goes to, to a place called Shunem, and he asks her, what can I give for you? Well, his, his, his servant Gehazi, uh, in verse 14 says, Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So he called her, I guess first, verse 15, and when he called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And he said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son uh, when the appointed time com had come of which Elisha had told her. He was a woman who had been barren, and just through the word of God, uh, Elijah provides for her a word of hope, and now she conceives and she has a child. God still has that power today. I know that there are some people maybe listening, there are some of you who've been hoping for children and doing what you need to do to be, to be, be have children. Uh, and God is not supplied yet, but don't, don't ever believe that he can't. Don't be, ever believe that he doesn't have the power uh, to do so. He is able to fill that void. Sometimes he doesn't do it the way we would think that he would. Sometimes it's by way of adoption. Sometimes it's by way, uh, uh, again, of, of, of having a child that's not necessarily biologically yours, but God still knows how to supply. And then notice what happens. At some point in this child's life, the child dies. The Bible says, that, the, that the, the mama, uh, like mothers do, didn't tell daddy nothing, go out in the field, say, hey, I need one of your servants today. The Bible clearly, you know, just kind of lays it out when you're looking um, uh, at, at the verses. Verse 24, it says, she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward and do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. She's on her way uh, because notice what verse 25 says. She departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. 
Uh, so when they, when they got there, uh, notice her response in verse 26. Please run now to meet her. That's uh, uh, Elijah speaking to Gehazi, Gehazi. And he's saying, it is well, is it well with you? It is, it, is it well with your husband? It is well with your child? And she answered, it is well. I love that, y'all. You know, that's, that song said, it is well. It is well. It is well with my soul. So here this woman, she is going through a, a, a situation where her child that she had been barren, could not have, has now died. And so now, but she goes to the man of God. She goes to the man of God because she believes that there is some help there. So she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Look at verse, in verse 20, 20, 28, verse 29. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. In other words, uh, 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 Elisha said Gehazi ahead of him. But, but she was saying, hey, 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 Rev, hey, Rev, hey, Rev. Hey, pastor. Hey, bishop, I'm not going anywhere unless you come with me. I'm not, go I'm not making a move until you come with me. Elisha goes with her, and the Bible says, the Bible says in verse 35, and he returned and walked back and forth in the house. He's in the house now and again went up, stretched himself out on the child. The child sneezed seven times. Oh, my God. Seven times the child had been dead, but now because of the man of God, because of the presence of God, because God is showing that he knows how to provide. And that's the thing that I just prayed with, uh, with Sharon Chandler. I wanted to say to her that I understand what the doctors are saying. I understand what's going on with Chris. I understand what's happening with Christine Henry. I understand what they're saying, but guess what? God has the last word. He has the power. I'm never going to demand God to raise her up, but I'm sure know how to ask him because I believe that if God could do it with Elisha and this child, I believe that right now this 36-year-old woman could get up from her sick bed and God could raise her up if he chooses to do. Why? Because that's the kind of power our God has. It's if he chooses, it's his will, it's if what he wants to do. And the Bible says that he raised up that child. Because remember, uh, 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 I, uh, Elijah becomes what for us? A representative of God. And let me tell you something, folks. In this season that we're going through right now, it's got some folk trying to reach out to you. Because they know in you as a child of God, you got the answer to that situation. There's some folk who have never had maybe not a whole lot of faith in you, not a whole lot of maybe even respect for you. But they are seeing you go through what you're going through right now and that you're still saying it is well with my soul. I have not been to 7818 Bonaire since the third Sunday in March, but it is well with my soul. Man, I've been stuck in this house since the middle of March. Can't go, don't really want to go anywhere because they telling me to stay at home but guess what it is well with my soul I've been furloughed on my job some folks say I lost my job but guess what as a child of God it is well with my soul because that's what God can do for us that's what God is able to do when we trust him, when we believe him, when we rely it doesn't always mean that he's going to do it the way we think he will but we got to still be convinced it is what I know you can Lord I know you can. We haven't having the same attitude that those three Hebrew boys had. If you don't, I know you can. And that's the attitude he wants us to have. Look at number five. I'm kind of rushing myself here. I'm, I'm almost too excited. Lord, calm me down just a little bit. He says the sons, the sons of the prophets, the sons of the prophets, the sons of the prophets ate some poison stew and was used by the Lord to cure it with flour. So people ate without harm. Look at, at chapter 4, verse 38 and 41. This is a good one. I think I got time to read this. It says, and Elijah returned to Gilgal, and there was famine in the land. Again, notice famine in the land. Famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, put on a large pot of balsam stew for the sons of the prophets. So, so one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine, and gathered it with a lap full of wild gourds, gourds, I'm sorry, and came and sliced them in the pot of stew. Boy, can you imagine? Though they did not know what they were. They hungry. They, they, they're trying to get something to eat. Then they served it to the men 
Now it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out, Oh, man of God, man of God, there's death in the pot. And they could not eat. So he said to them, bring some flour. And he put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. Oh, my God. Praise the Lord. Here's this. They were hungry. They're looking for a way to eat something. And here they are. They just going out wherever. And they grabbing some stuff that, that was not good for them. They put it in the stew. When they eat it, the Bible says it makes them sick. But what, what, does, it, what does God use Elijah to do? Put, get some flour. Uses that flour. Put that flour in the stew. And the stew, and the stew was all right. Now, I don't know about you all. I don't know if I'd have been the first one to take a bite after you put that stew in. But, but in, the, in the end of the day, they went back and they ate that stew. Why? Because God provided a cure. God provided a cure for what was ailing them. And listen, listen. Now, this is, this is the kind of thing sometimes when I'm talking to my, my daddy and uh, have some conversations with Ed Sis. A lot, a lot of times when we, you know, we got to travel this, this, that, and other. They used to tell about some things about my grandmother that a person could be sick, and my grandmother could go out, or the you know, people back in that day, if you will, they could go out in a field somewhere, and they could find plants. And these plants, would they would use those plants, make tea, or whatever they would do with those plants, sometimes just rubbing it on a person, whatever it was, and people would get healed from, that, from some of that stuff. My God. So I'm saying that's the kind of power that our God has. He was showing what? That I will take care of my own. Now I want you to understand this. Just because I'm a child of God don't mean I won't get sick. God never said that. Because I'm a child of God, God never said to any of us, we, go, we won't get COVID-19. Never told us that. But God does say, even if it happens, I have the power to heal you. And listen, I want y'all to think about something. We're in this pandemic right now, and we're hearing what Dr. Fucci is saying. We're hearing what Dr. Burks is saying. We're hearing what the World Health Organization is saying. They say, hey, man, it's going to be a while before we have a vaccine. Some of folks are talking about maybe a couple of months and all of that, but y'all know it's going to take a while longer. Unless God does something miraculous that they're able to discover the healing elements that are going to be there. And guess what? At the end of the day, when the the healing going, is going to come. Let's make sure, those of us who are believers, we're not giving any credit to the government overall. We're not giving any credit to the doctors overall. We're going to give God the praise. We're going to give God the glory. We're going to give God the credit because what we will know, that when the healing will come, he will have provided that healing. Amen. 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 Uh, the Lord blessed, number five, the Lord blessed a hundred people to eat food from a knapsack that was multiplied through the word of Elijah. Look at chapter four at verse 42 now. Then a man came from Baal, Shalisha, and brought the man of God bread of the fruit, first fruits, 20 loaves of barley bread, and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, give it to the people that they may eat. But his servant said, what? Shall I set this before 100 men? He said again, give it to the people that they may eat. For thus, here it is again, says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. Oh, <laughs> oh my God, here it is. Well, we say it again. God can take a little and turn it into a lot. God, God can take, listen, listen, listen. God can take, I think, I, I think I'm saying that word right, mashpan. I think that's what it is. God will take a little bit of grain, cornbread, and he'll turn that thing into a mashpan. I, I didn't really like mashpan that much because it went with milk. You know, I'd eat mashpan on the side, but anything that had milk in it, I wasn't good with it. But I, I learned something from back in the day that our parents could take just a little bit of something and turn it into a, just a big smorgasbord, man. That it looked like the whole family would eat on just that little bit of stuff that God had a way of stretching it. And so what God was showing again, that he is the all-powerful God that can take a little and turn it into a lot. And I know when y'all reading this, I know you, you got to be thinking about the two fish and five barley loaves. You got to be. There's no way you can't be thinking about Jesus right now because Elisha, in a very real sense, was a type of Jesus Christ that he took a little. Of course, Jesus took two fish, five barley loaves, fed 5,000. But 
Elisha, with the little that he had, God used him to be able to feed a hundred people. And listen, some of us, y'all, some, y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Many of you have come from houses that your house was the house that everybody went to to eat. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Your house was the house that the folk in the community went to get something to eat. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And God had a way of providing the resources that were necessary so that your mom, your dad, your big mama, your mother, whoever it was, they were able to provide for so many people with just a little. Because, again, God provides for his children. Here's another one. Uh, number six, Naaman, the commander, uh, the commander of the Syrian army, was healed, if you fill it in the blanks, by the Lord from leprosy when he obeyed the word of Elijah. That's in chapter 5, uh, verse 1 through 27. Of course, Naaman was a commander of the Syrian army. He was not even an Israelite, if you will. He, was, he would be referred to as a Gentile. He has leprosy. The news get around that there's a man uh, named by a prophet by the name of Elijah who 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 God is is working on. So Naaman takes a a a part of his uh, regime, his army, and they go to where Elijah is. Um, And uh, if you again, uh, it it would remind us of that in verse eight. So when it was heard, Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes and that he sent to the king, saying. Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Now watch this. And Elisha sent a message to him saying, go. Now notice, he, he the commander, right? He the general. He the big chief. You know, he, when he shows up with his chariots and his horses to Elijah's house, he expect Elijah to come out. He expect Elijah to wave some kind of magic wand. He expect, you know, Elijah to give some incantation, all of that kind of thing. All Elijah says is, look at this. All he says is, in, is, is in verse, in verse number, uh, number 10, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. Oh, <laughs> and the dude say, Jack, the dude say, no, I ain't going to, hey, it's got some other water. It's got some other places that I can go wash. It got some rivers that are cleaner than that old nasty Jordan. Don't you be telling me to go wash in that Jordan. His servants look at him and say, hey, dude, hey, Naaman, hey, if Elijah told you to do a great thing, I'm talking about go up a mountain, kill a bear and a lion and all that kind of thing, what have you done? He say, oh, yeah. He said, now, what's the big deal, man? If he telling you to go wash in the Jordan, just go wash in the Jordan, man. And so now watch this. Verse 14 says, so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying, here it is, thus said the Lord of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Praise the Lord. Wasn't nothing elaborate, wasn't no major nothing, just go dip seven times in the Jordan and you will be healed. Listen, I, 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 I am thinking about this, though, y'all. Listen, you know, sometimes when it comes to the things of God, sometimes we do act like Naaman. I don't know about you all. God will tell us, go do something simple, just something real simple. But like, oh, no, that, oh, no. It's got to be something. Oh, it's got to be something more than that. God has said, just obey me. Just do what I'm telling you, just keep it simple. I'm learning this, I guess, as as I get older as a pastor. You know, when I meet with folk and and we kind of lay it out, this is what you need to do. This is what does said the Lord. So go back now and do what God said. And sometimes those folk will come back to me and say, Pastor, such and such and so and so. I say, hey, did you do what we talked about the last time? They say, well, no. I say, well, we ain't got nothing to talk about then. Because until you do what the Lord say, you will never see what the Lord can do. 
God is saying to somebody right now, there's something simple that God wants you to do, but you just being stubborn and disobedient and bullheaded, and you just won't do it. And sometimes you just can't see how, how much the Lord will bless you if you would just obey what he says. Oh, just be just do what he said. If this is what he said, just do it. Stop arguing with him. Stop trying to find out some other way to get around it. Some things are just simple. Like right now, listen, I know some of y'all, I know I can just only imagine, and, I, and listen, I feel some of you all. You haven't, you haven't been in the building since third Sunday in March. And I know right now, some stuff, it just don't feel like church. It just don't, ooh, I just can't, I just can't get into it. But watch this. I'm, I'm going to just say it this way. The man of God, Pastor Lee Skinner, been telling y'all, get up on Sunday morning, dress yourself, comb your hair, brush your teeth, put on some nice clothes, get yourself ready for worship, and watch what God will do. But some of y'all want to stay in the bed. Some of y'all want to stay with that stuff in y'all eyes. Don't want to get up. Don't want to do it. And then you say, oh, Lord, I just ain't going to be satisfied until I get back to the building. I'm telling you, keep it simple. Just do, just do what the man of God is saying. <laughs> I had thought to say that, but that just came to me. And that's a good one. That's a good one. Many of you are frustrated with your pastors and you think, hey, man, we ought to listen. Listen to the man of God. Listen to what he is telling you to do because his concern is genuinely for you. So I'm telling some of y'all, next Sunday, keep it simple. You getting ready for the Lord's table. Just get your elements right now. Don't be using no excuse on Saturday night. Say, well, oh, we didn't get it. No, I'm telling you, do the simple things. Just obey what God says. Listen, folks, if the Lord is laying upon your heart to call somebody, don't delay it. Just call that person. That person come to your mind. Do what you have to do. Even if you got to call Julia, call Julia. Say, you know, so-and-so been on my mind. Could I have their phone number? Find out who that deacon is, whoever it may be. The Lord may be laying it on somebody's heart to say, listen, I've been thinking about fixing a meal for somebody. Maybe Sister Bertrand, somebody you hadn't thought about, somebody you hadn't seen in a while. Just do what the Lord is saying and watch, watch what he helps you to see as a result. Whew, I'm almost having too much fun with this right now. Number seven, the Lord made an iron axe float when Elijah used a stick to find it. Woo! Chapter chapter six, he made a uh, and, and watch this. Here it is. They they were they getting ready. The 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 the, the sons of the prophets um, want, needed to build another building because it, the building where they were learning from Elijah it was it was it was getting too small. So they trying to build another building. And the Bible says in verse five. But as one was cutting down a tree again, that was to make the wood. The iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, "Alas, master, for it was borrowed." So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick, threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Somebody should have jumped and ran right there. Y'all should have just jumped up and ran because y'all acting like y'all hear this all the time. You don't hear this all the time. Notice what he said. He cut off a stick. He cut off a stick. It didn't say he cut off a magnet. It didn't say he cut off a piece of iron. He cut off a stick, threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Listen, folks, y'all, y'all, come on. How does a stick find iron? Really? I mean, think about it. Therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand, and he took it. What is showing us? That God can do some impossible things, some things that look so simple, some things that, that look impossible. God can do those things, man, and just give us so much great joy in life and to recognize, and, and I, don't, I don't know about you all. I don't know about you all. Again, I'm, I'm, again, I'm 61 now, and, and, and sometimes I forget, I forget where I put some stuff. I, I'm serious. I forget. I be, I be, and I actually be walking around saying, Lord, please help me. Lord, please help me to remember. Lord, please help me to remember where I put that thing. Lord, help me to remember. Where did I put that thing? Where did I put that thing? And guess what? I am convinced that the Lord brings that back to my memory. I am thoroughly convinced he helps me to find what I lost. 
And if there's anybody, if anybody don't believe what I'm saying, I'm telling you, try him. You just, you just try him. Young folk, I know y'all got some good memories and all of that and all of that. Yeah, and y'all, don't, y'all don't forget anything. But I'm telling you, no matter what it is, you just ask the Lord. God will do some great things to help us to restore that which we, we feel like we've lost. I got I to gotta rush on. Number eight, Elijah was used by the Lord to help his servants see, first blank, the blind, watch this, to help his servants see. Then the second thing he did was blind the eyes of his enemy. Then he provided food uh, for the enemy. I'm sorry, I got I to, then, 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 then provided the enemy food. He provided the enemy food. So, so we see that in chapter 6, and I talked about that on Sunday. Uh, didn't go to the last part of that, but when, you, when you're looking at the, uh, the, the, the uh, issues that are going on in, in chapter 6, on Sunday we talked about, remember, that, that the, the city of Samaria is surrounded, right? Uh, the house of Elijah is surrounded. The sermon comes out, you know, after getting stuff out of his eyes in the morning, he gives his yawn, and he looks outside and he sees the army all around him. Oh, my goodness. And no, so he says, he says to Elijah, what shall we do? Remember what I talked about Sunday, the other side of what shall we do? What shall we do? And here was, and here's what God did. God, uh, Elijah prayed in verse 17, Lord, pray, open his eyes that he may see. The Lord opened his eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around him. Then notice what happens. Then Elijah prayed and those men that were actually there to overtake Elijah are now blind. Now watch this. Here's the cool part. It happens now. Elijah leads them from where they were. He leads them about 10 miles away in, back into Samaria. Look at, pick it up at verse 24. And it happened that Ben-Hadad, king of, the, of Syria, gathered all his army together and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver, one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings, four, uh, five shekels of silver. Uh, then as, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, uh, this is in the Bible, y'all, so I know some of you all have read it, but it's, it's, what, it's, it's what was taking place in the, in the nation. Evil kings, and there were just some serious issues that were going on. Uh, verse 27, and he said, if the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you, from the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, this is, this is a sad story in the Bible. What, what is troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat your son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him but she had hidden her son. Oh, my God. Now the king is angry. He is angry. He is angry at what he's heard. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes, and as he passed by on the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, God do so to me, and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, that remains on him today. But Elisha was sitting in the house, and the elders were sitting with him, and the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of the master's feet behind him? And while he was still talking, to them. And there was the messenger coming down to him. Then the king said, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Wow, here's what's happening. Here's what's happening. This man is so angry. He is mad at, at what this woman has said. So he's angry at Elijah because he's blaming. He say, Elijah, this is your fault. He sends a messenger to Elijah's house to kill Elijah, to destroy Elijah. But while the messenger is on the way, the Bible says that God reveals to Elijah what's getting ready to happen. While the messenger is in the house giving the message, the, the king now is coming behind the messenger because he recognizes Elijah only got so much power. 
this has to be. Woo! This got to be. And so what he's recognizing now, because of the evil of our nation, because we are so terrible, because we are doing so many things against the Lord, it's a great possibility now that, no, 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 this calamity is from the Lord. Folk, you got to understand, God is not the author of evil. God is not the author of evil. God will, oh, God will never say He'll never do anything from an evil perspective. But understand, we live in a fallen world. And there are times that God will allow some evil things to take place. Why? Because he is in control of it all. But to demonstrate to us that he has the power, he will allow sometimes some dreadful things to take place in our lives so that we will know beyond the shadow of a doubt. He reminds us in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, he causes all things, including the evil things, including the bad things, including the fact that there's a mama that's concerned about a daughter that the doctors are saying are going is, could die. He causes co the coronavirus that's in the world, everything that can happen to us. He can cause all things to work together for are good. Why? Because it's according to his purpose. God got a purpose for everything that he does. And there are a lot of things that he does. We don't like it. We don't, it don't feel good to us. But we got to know he is a father who cares about us. My daddy, my daddy, my daddy could whip y'all. I told y'all that. My daddy, my daddy was strong too. My daddy, because he handled them, them big old bales of hay and all that kind of thing all the time. My dad was strong. And so to handle a kid like me, that wasn't a problem for my dad. My dad grabbed one arm and he could take that strap man, hit me in the same spot as many times as he chooses because he was just that strong. But you know what? I never had a sense that my daddy didn't love me. I never had a sense that my daddy didn't care about me. I understood this hurt that he putting on me. It's hurting right now. But at the end of the day, even after I got hurt, I still would go to my daddy for what I needed. And God will say to us, help me, Holy Spirit. God will say to us, I will allow certain things to happen, but it's in order that you know that I am God, and at the end of the day, I want you to come back to me. I want you to return to me. I want you to love me. I want you to obey me. I want you to, to depend on nobody else but me. And sometimes when we forget that, he got to spank us and get us back where we need to be. This king real, realized that, and he said, hey, man, I know this thing is from, is from the Lord. And now at this point, the only thing that I can do is, is wait on the Lord. That's all I can do. I got to fill in the blanks, y'all, and then, and then, you know, we got we to end. Number, number nine, I went, uh, I'm sorry, number ten. The Lord restored the Shunammite's property after seven, after seven year absence because, Eli, because of Elijah. The woman's property, that's the answer, that property. And then number 11 is, Elijah wept over what the Lord revealed about Hazael the king that he told him to ordain. I just, I just want to share that one with you before, before we close. Look at chapter 8. Uh, Elijah spoke to the woman. No, I'm sorry. Not, I, I actually gave you the wrong one there. Um, go to uh, chapter, chapter, look at verse 7. Go to ch verse 7. It should have been verse 7. I'm sorry. Um, Elijah went to Damascus, Ben Hadad, king of Assyria, was sick, and was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazael, Take a present in your hand and go to meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels loads, and he came, stood before him, and said, Your son Ben Hadad, king of Assyria, has sent me to say to you, Shall I recover from this disease? And Elijah said to him, Go say to him, You shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. And he set his countenance uh, in a stare until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why is my Lord weeping? And he answered, Because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel, that strongholds you will set on fire, that young men you will kill with the sword, and you will dash their, their children and rip open their, the, their women with child. So Haziel said, 
What is your servant, a dog, that he should do this gross thing? And Elijah said, the Lord has shown me that you will become king over Syria. Then he departed from Elijah and came to his master who said, what did Elijah say to you? And he answered, he told me you would utterly recover. But here was the problem. Elijah had been given the responsibility early on in, in our first kings that he was going to ordain this king to be the king of Israel or the king over Syria. Um, uh, it's about seven, maybe ten years later, he now has, or is, 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 has met this man. And, and, and Elisha knows that this guy is evil. He knows that he's a wicked king. But notice, even though he was a wicked king, in the kingdom of God that God controls, God had raised up this king for a purpose. Yeah, he knew he was evil. He knew what this man was going to do. But it still didn't stop God from raising him up in order that he might be a tool that God would use to demonstrate his disappointment, his, his, uh, his uh, sorrow, his, his, his lack of delight in the nation of Israel. God is doing something in the United States of America that many of us do not understand. We don't understand it. We don't get it. But let's keep in mind, this is still God's world. This is still his kingdom, and he still rules. Believe that today with everything that is in you. Father, how we love you, how we thank you, how we bless you, honor you, and praise you for your greatness and your goodness and your kindness toward us. Thank you for knowing that you are the king of the world, and you have not relinquished your kingship to anybody. Help us as your children to trust you, to be the servants that you've called for us to be, so that we can live out our lives in such a way that it brings glory and praise and honor to you. We pray these things now in the name of your son, Jesus, who is the very Christ of God. Amen. Until we meet again, good shepherd, don't forget, let's get our elements ready for uh, first Sunday as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, keep praying for Kristen Henry. This is our sister Chandler's granddaughter. Uh, we pray for Cheryl, her daughter, uh, as her mom is again grieving over what the doctors are telling her about the possibility of what could take place with her daughter. Until then, let's call on each other, check about, check on each other, love each other. Um, chill. Be content. Trust God. Rely on God. Because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I love you, good shepherd. Until we meet again. Goodbye.